<laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for having us today. Um, short sales and foreclosures. Short sales, I know, aren't really uh, in abundance right now. They were, you know, years ago, in like 2008, 2009. Um, so we're just kind of give you the basic overview. A short sale is when the mortgage or the, or the homeowner sells a property for less than due to the bank, which can happen. I currently have one in Flemington. The woman owes about 730 on it and it's only worth about 650. I mean, they bought the house back in, I think 2006, 2007 when prices were elevated. So people you know, that overpaid for homes might be in a market, even though home prices are up, might still be underwater because back then, you know, everything was really high. So <clears throat> the third party is the buyer, you know, and everything goes, all the proceeds go to the lender. The homeowner, gets nothing, sometimes you can negotiate a, uh, like a relocation fee, maybe like three to $5,000 to help pack up the house and move. Um, when you're short, say you're short like 100 grand, there's the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Relief Act, which keeps getting uh, renewed every year by Congress. Um, up to $750,000 on your primary residence. So if you have an investment property, and you're trying to short it because you drained all the equity out of it and decided to buy, you know, a sports car or something like that, not gonna happen. It's really difficult. Yeah. So primary residence only. How a short sale works, it's up to the lender to approve the short sale. You can't just write up a contract, say, okay, well, we're not gonna pay that hundred grand and everything and get to closing. Um, some in some states. They might be able to do like go after you for the difference, but with the mortgage debt forgiveness relief act that should be wiped out. I also tell people talk to your accountant because they will send you, I think it's a 1099 because they have to show they're actually considering that hundred grand as income to you because you didn't pay it, but it was on, it, it's an accounting thing. So, talk to your accountant or tell, advise them to talk to their accountant. Um, the financial consequences are less severe than a foreclosure. Like you might come up to people and they say, oh, I'm just gonna let it go to the bank. And you say, well, yeah. that's not really a good idea. Let's, let's try a short sale. It doesn't cost the homeowner anything. You know, you're doing all the marketing, everything. Um, their credit won't be as bad at the end of the process because you know, like a foreclosure can be drawn out for you know, four or five years and that's you not making a payment for four or five years. So your credit just keeps going down and down. Um, so they can buy another home faster. With a foreclosure on your record, you gotta wait seven years. The short sale, it's a lot shorter. Yeah, it's like two or three. Yeah, and lenders, like mortgage people are look at that more favorably than a foreclosure on your record. Um, what needs to happen? The bank needs to sign off on the uh, short sale, also known as a pre-foreclosure sale. You can't short sale a house that you're current with payments on because the bank's gonna look at it and go, well, you're still making a payments on it, so no, you don't need to sell it and we're not doing the it short. It's most of the time, like I said before, with people that say, oh, I'm, I'm so far behind, I'm just gonna walk away and they'll you know, move to Florida or something like that. Uh, or, as some people do, the house will be in the husband's name and they drain all the equity out of it and everything and save up all their money and then they buy a house in the wife's name because she has perfect credit. We've seen that happen before. <laughs> so there's a lot of documentation that needs to be done and it can be a very lengthy process. Also, the property has to be listed at fair market value. You can't just say, oh, well, we're just gonna short it, be a fire sale, we'll put it on the market, you know, it's worth five, we'll sell it for 350. Because the bank is gonna send somebody out, yep. like Kyle or I, yep. to do a BPO on it, which is broker's price opinion, also known as a CMA. Yeah, sometimes they'll send two people too. Yeah, so they'll get, you know, varying opinions. So if your list price and your sale price aren't in line with current market values, then they're gonna say, no, we want more money, which if you see on the MLS sometimes, 
it'll be the list price of like 175, but now it's listed for 250. Well, the bank said, no, we're not going to sell it for 175. 250 is our bottom line. So the one I'm selling in Flemington, we listed it for 550 and got an offer for 630, which is in line. And the bank goes, yeah, it looks great. Now, sometimes they'll do an approved. I guess they'll, you can actually list it. Yeah, you can. Um, oop, wrong button. Yeah, you can start the process before listing it. You know, and that way it's an approved short sale, which you see on the MLS, or it'll be the in the process of getting approval. You know, in this type of market, you know, it's better just put it on the MLS and then start getting the documents you need, which is, can be a long list. Um, the hardship letter, you got to plead to the bank your case. You know, I lost my husband or we had medical bills or we got divorced and I can only, I can't pay the mortgage with one income. Um, 30 days of recent pay stubs from both sellers, 60 days of bank statements, two years of tax filings, short sale package. Every bank has a different package. Every bank has a different form. You got to get third party authorization form signed. Uh, the HOA, most of the time, if they're not paying the mortgage, they're not paying the HOA. <laughs> so those, the HOA will start filing liens, um, you know, executed listing agreement, MLS sheet, pre-approval letter, and proof of funds from the buyer. So the bank wants to see, okay, they're approved for 500 with the down payment of, you know, 50,000. Where's that 50,000 coming from? We want to be able to see that before they approve it and say, okay, let's go ahead and close. And then the buyer is like, oh, I don't qualify, which we've all seen that, right? <laughs> Valid reasons for a short sale. There's only a few. You can't just say, I don't want to live here anymore, or my house is underwater, you know, because they might not approve that short sale. Um, unemployment, excessive use of credit, draining the equity. Uh, illness, illness in the family, death in the family, marital status, like I said before. Um, they're more likely to, like I said, more likely to approve if you can demonstrate a financial hardship um, caused by an event out of control of the seller, which, you know, like COVID, everybody goes, went on unemployment. Um, the downsides. Everyone with a lien on the property has to agree. Everybody's got to get along. But if you have medical bills and now they've filed a lien on you, or um, sometimes you'll see like the US Treasury or the state of New Jersey or you know, a doctor's office or um, American Express can put a lien on your house. Mm -hmm. The mortgage is first on a list and then there's everybody else below it. Well, since you're going to be short, the first guy gets the money and the rest of the guys, they get nothing. Which I explain to people, if it goes to sheriff sale, all those people are going to get wiped out anyway. So either they lose now or they lose later. They're going to lose. Um, things that are not... Oh, that's on the next slide. Never mind. Um, a lot of paperwork and time. Short sale approval can take anywhere from 30 to 180 days. If you're sure everybody knows the notorious Bank of America that takes forever. Choose the right attorney. Attorneys can make or break a transaction, not just a short sale, any transaction, I'm sure. But some attorneys will charge a fee. Sometimes the, P the bank pays the fee. Sometimes the agent pays the fee. It could be 1% or 2%. You know, we always sign listings at 6%. I and mean, everybody should be signing any listing at 6%. But um, on this, the banks are paying the commissions. So sometimes an attorney will chart, will take 1%. So if you sign it at six, you get two and a half, two and a half, and the attorney gets one. There are some people that will take 2%, which honestly, I think is robbery. I know a guy who does that. I set the whole thing up and he wanted 2% of the commission. I was like, wait a minute, I did all the work and I'm going to pay you 10 grand. No. So yeah, short sale companies out there take part of your commission. Some of those companies will bill the bank, like the attorney uh, that we work with, he bills the bank, all the fees and everything. 
Uh, the bank can change the commission since they are technically like the owner, uh, which you also see on the MLS, which everybody should put on the MLS. Um, oh, what split is it? Equally. Yeah, any reduction in commission will be split equally between the agents. Because, you know, if you sign it at six and you're keeping three and a half and a bank says, well, we're only going to pay you two and a half, you know, you could split that with the other agent. And that's uh, short sales. Any questions on that? Okay, you say that the order of, of uh, I guess, credit is mortgage comes first. Right. The first position. Yeah, everybody else is just falls on. How about taxes, property taxes? Where does that They get paid. They get paid. Anything? It's probably second in line. <laughs> yeah, because it's got to have clear title when it sells. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's some, of that, <laughs> some of that will be consider, uh, covered in the next section. <laughs> no, <you're good. laughs> Not sorry. No, but, yeah. <laughs> Next time I redo this, I'll put that in in this section too. So, with um, everything that's going on with COVID and people being out of work, is that right? Do you anticipate or see anything in the future as short sales popping up again? They're saying that since things changed in the whole housing crisis of two thousand eight, and uh, lending got a little bit more stricter. People have more equity in their home now, so they're not going to be behind. And it's been 13 years yeah. since the crash. Yeah. So, you know, think about 13 years on a 30 year mortgage, you're halfway through it already. You should, should have that much equity in your house. Some people use their house as a cash machine and keep taking money out. Especially when rates are 2.5% last year. Yeah. If you look at the refinances, the top. a lot of them, and they took out big loan of values. So, yeah, it's, you yeah. don't know what to say, but. The government keeps saying, oh, no, it's 0% it's of a foreclosure wave coming. No, you 0%, you can't have that 0% of anything. So, you know, short sales, they, they might come back. Like, people that didn't buy them, people that bought at the height of the market. You know, like the one I'm doing in Flemington. You know, it was a new construction. They're the original owner. You know, they paid, I think they paid like eight fifty for it. And it's only worth six now. You know, and I sold a house two doors down from that three years ago. That guy owed the bank over a million dollars. He got a triple mortgage on the house and eventually went to jail for mortgage fraud. And we sold that house. The bank was owed a million two, million three. We sold it for four seventy five. But yeah. another thing is too, like, it's funny because they won't call a real estate agent until it's already too late. So chances are when they call you, they're already upside down. So like if they missed one payment, they're not just going to call you and say, hey, I think I got to do a short sale. Chances are they're going to be getting notices upon notices upon notices, and they're going to be paying crazy, crazy points and interest, and they're going to be in arrears to where it's like, okay, now it's a little bit different. Like if somebody called you today, like they're not going to be behind. But in a year, two, three... It could change. Even like right now, 2.5%, like, what do you got, like 2.8%, like, it's really cheap, but if you start missing payments, that's, yes. that's not, it's not your percent anymore. Um, so, something to take into consideration. Yeah, chances are, if you fall behind on your payments, there's an 80% chance that you will not catch up. Especially because in Jersey. If you couldn't pay three grand this month, how are you going to pay six next month, or nine the next month? Gambling, that's a good way to solve things. <laughs> the question I have on this, is I've seen a couple of times where there were sellers that, like you said, they were all behind and stuff, and they were being told, uh, I guess, to stall off foreclosure, that as long as they were listed uh, in an MLS, they would restrict the, the hours, they would not have a lockbox, they, they trashed the house to make it look like nobody would want to buy it, mm -hmm. but it allegedly was a way to stall and they could stay there longer. No, they, 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 we've seen this. We actually know a guy, which I won't say the address because it's all in the MLS right now, who's doing this same exact thing right now. He has it priced like 200 grand too high. You know, it's probably I'm talking about it, it. It's a good tactic, but it just doesn't work. I mean, right now you can't file, obviously, but once, you know, people are able to file, like if you have a PNC, Wells Fargo, anything like that, you could be, you know, miss the last 14 payments or if you're on, you know, any sort of government program right now, they, they can't really come after you because you're protected. But once that lifts, 
you know, you might see some of that, but it doesn't really slow anything down. Um, they might say, okay, well, yeah, I'm trying to sell it, but, you know, they have so many systems and so many people like us that they'll, they'll call us up like he just did one for a $2 million house. Hey, what's this place worth? They're, they're asking like 2.6. And he's like, well, it's worth, what'd you say? 1.5. 1.5. So there you go. So <laughs> perfect example. Yeah. They're not stupid. They got tons of websites that we don't even have access to. And then they got boots on the ground, which is like people like ourselves, you know, giving them values. Like they'll go out and they'll go get five, six, seven values. Um, not just look at the listing. So I guess somewhat related to that, that mortgage forbearance that keep extending three months, three months, which I think is the end of June. Yeah, right now. If they yeah. don't renew that or maybe give it one last shot, isn't there like gonna be a group of people that all this time they've not paid in those properties, some of them will come to the market? That that's where people are saying there's gonna be zero percent wave. We have to think about it. Those people stopped paying say the first of the year or you know, middle of last year. Once the process starts, it'll take, well, now the courts are backed up. It might take four or five years to get to those people. Over a thousand days easily. Yeah, but the people that were supposed to be foreclosed on last year, they're already on the books. They stopped paying the mortgage four or five years back. I mean, you're going back to you know 2016. Yeah. They stopped paying their mortgage. Four or five yeah. years back? Or oh, yeah. 2017. I know a guy who hasn't paid a mortgage in over 10 years. Yeah, because then you could file bankruptcy to extend. There's, there's different ways. The attorneys are smart. Yeah. But, but to answer your question a little bit more, too, the, the people who maybe will, will try to you know, look at their options, they'll try to do some loss mitigation with the bank and try to do some sort of, uh, uh, what word am I looking for here? They call it the, uh, the loan mod. Loan yeah, loan modification. So, yeah. But sometimes they don't qualify either. So if you don't qualify for a loan mod, you're, yeah, you're pretty they, much out of luck. A loan mod, they take the amount that you owe them. Say you owed them twenty grand In arrears. In arrears. And they're going to either tack it on to the end or spread it out over the rest of the loan. But if you still don't have the income to pay that adjusted mortgage payment, which is now going to be a little bit more than you had to pay, it's kind of you know, you're kind of falling behind. Like I said, if you can't pay three, you're not gonna pay six. And when you get behind, you can't just say, oh, well, I'll give you 1,500 bucks a month till I can catch up. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. They will not take a payment. It's all or nothing. There's sometimes they'll send the check back to you yeah. or they'll just put it in an account, but they won't credit your account. They'll just hold it. And eventually if that money gets to the amount that you owe them, then they'll transfer the whole amount to the payoff. But, but it's, everybody's payments are so high in New Jersey because of taxes. It's, yeah. It's very hard to catch up. Like, for instance, most people pay eight fifty a month in tax. It's ten grand a year. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And the bank has to keep paying those taxes because they don't want to lose the first position on the home. So, all right. How to submit offers on foreclosure. Step one, don't be scared. A lot of people... I've met agents, been in this industry 20, 30 years, and they're like, oh, no, we, we, don't, we don't do foreclosures. I'm like, why? You're, you're limiting your clients. You know, there are a lot of nice houses out there. Like, I mean, some of the ones that we've sold, like the farm. We sold a $1.3 million horse farm. Um, the process can take the same amount of time as a regular transaction or could be faster. It's totally different than a short sale. They want to get this house sold. They want to get it off their books. So read everything, starting with the MLS. What are the viewing instructions? What are the instructions on how to submit offers? Usually it doesn't go to the agent. It'll go to an online resource like propoffers.com, hubzoo, auction.com, ResNet, Equator, and there's a whole list of other ones. Uh, these are the most popular ones. Usually in the, uh, in the MLS, there'll be a link like ResNet. It'll say like agent.resnet. You know, and a whole bunch of letters and numbers. So offers have to be approved by the bank before sending the addendum, the REO addendum to the buyer. Uh, this could take a few days. It's not like, you know, we present an offer to the seller and he says, oh yeah, okay, cool. We'll, we'll go with this guy over here and they sign it and everything. The offer has to go into the system. The asset manager has to read it. They have to send it up to the investor, which could be, 
like Goldman Sachs or Wilmington Savings Trust or a hedge fund or something else, that person has to review it and see, you know, look at the file, see if the value's there, and then get back and say, okay, you know, we approve this one. Um, the addendum is specifically made for each buyer. That way um, it has the name of the buyer and the price and the address of the property. So, you know, if it says subject to seller addendum, that's what they mean. The addendum that comes after the accepted offer. We don't have the uh, addendum on file. It's not just a blank, you know, addendum. It's like a normal transaction, but different. Yes, you can do inspections, but don't expect the seller to give you any credits for it. Uh, most listings state as they're sold in the as is condition. That means what you see is what you get. Um, you can do an attorney review period like a regular transaction. In other states, like my sister's an agent in Virginia, she said they don't have attorney review. You sign a contract, that's it, you're locked. So New Jersey's actually pretty good in that. Um, we did have an attorney, which goes along with choosing the right attorney, um, who tried to tell us this was different, but um, you will not lose your EMD, AKA the initial deposit. In REO, you know, I know it says on a contract, initial deposit, which is usually $1,000. In REO, you have to make it 1% of the purchase price or more. So if you're buying a $500,000 house, you gotta have a $5,000 uh, EMD. Don't make it a crazy number like $50,000 because um, it's, it's really unnecessary. Um, in New Jersey, it's called liquidated damages. We can't keep it. And most attorneys should know this. Some of them don't. Um, I don't know why they advise their clients otherwise. Um, other states, they can keep the EMD, which I've talked to one of our SVPs. And he's like, I want to keep the EMD. And I told him, I said, you can't. Why not? I said, it's the law in New Jersey. If I was in Pennsylvania, I know the law is there. Maybe you could. He's down in Texas. Maybe you can there. In New Jersey, they can't. Uh, be aware of timelines. The inspection timelines start from the time the seller signs the contract. It doesn't start after attorney review. And it doesn't go by business days. It goes by days. So if they say seven days and I sign a contract today, you have seven days from today. And they're not really concerned about the mortgage uh, commitment timeline. Goes along with choose the right attorney. Please choose an attorney that knows how to do foreclosure transactions. They can make or break a, tra a, a transaction. Um, I gotta give a shout out to Marty Egan in Morristown. Amazing on foreclosures. He sends out a term review letter that says, I understand everything. And I was like, what? <laughs> he, he works great. Um, we did a, a job uh, transaction with him. We, were, we represented the seller. Actually, Coldwell Banker was also representing the buyer. And he's very, it was perfect. yeah, very smooth. Um, some attorneys that I've run into will, you know, they say they're real estate attorneys. But, you know, just like any realtor, like Kyle and I specialize in REO, you know, Ken might specialize in buyers and Alan specializes in commercial. And some attorneys, they want to send a seven page attorney review letter. You're buying it as is. My, my attorney is going to say no. Right. You know, if you want something, you know, change like the closing date or, um, I don't know, property. Something small, easy. Like, yeah, you know, that's logical. Or inspections, you know, when people were really busy, if they said, hey, listen, our inspector can only be there Tuesday and we, we're, we're done on Friday. Well, okay, we'll extend it till Tuesday because you told us, stuff like that. Yeah. Like basics. Just always be communicating. And be prepared to do everything. Uh, most likely you'll have to get the smoke cert and anything else that the town requires, including the well inspection. On a normal transaction, the seller is responsible for the well inspection and the smoke cert. On a foreclosure, the buyer is responsible for everything. So, you know, usually they do the home inspection and the septic inspection, but you also have to get smoke cert. You might have to put these smoke detectors up. 
you have to get the fire extinguisher, you got to schedule everything with the town um, and the well inspection, anything that's you know, required for closing. It's kind of all lopsided on one side. Foreclosures have clear title. Do not ask the agent if there's liens on a property, it has clear title, if the taxes are being paid. They can't sell, you, well, not only a bank, but anybody can't sell a property without clear title. So they will make sure that the title is clear before they even list the property. If something does pop up, they'll pull it off the market and then you know, fix everything and then put it back on. Because when they get to closing, they don't wanna be responsible for delay of closing. So um, once a property goes to sheriff's sale, all liens are wiped out except municipal liens. That's what you're talking about, Alan, with the taxes yeah. and everything. So um, sometimes, like the taxes will be paid. On our properties, the bank always takes care of the taxes, um, but the sewer and water, you know, we'll, we'll have to call the town and bring everything up to uh, current status. So also, uh, I was gonna say something else that I forget now. So uh, yeah, the bank's always paying the taxes, you know, and they have insurance on it. And they're, they're ready. When they put it on the market, they're ready. Sometimes we've had properties for six months just sitting there and we're like, hey, when are we gonna list this? They're like, oh, no, we, there, there's a problem. We, we gotta figure it out first. So, and I didn't put it in here, but when you submit an offer, they'll say there is $100 per diem, which means if you don't close on time, they're gonna charge you $100 a day till you do. Some banks are really stringent on that. Most of them aren't, you know, like if you need a two week extension, and you explain to them, hey, you know, uh, the appraiser got jammed up or, you know, we ordered the smoke cert late or, you know, something like that. Some, you know, accidents happen, you know? So you just say, hey, look, and if you present everything to them and say, you know, we got the mortgage commitment, we're just waiting on this, or, you know, they wanna see that you're making forward progress. Because trust me, they wanna get the house sold too. They don't wanna pull the house from you and sell it to somebody else because, they're gonna to have to start all over with another 60 days. That's, uh, make it did I, so easy. yeah, it is. It really like people, is. Yeah, people are scared is. of it and it's, you know, it's really easy. Like, especially if you work with Kyle and I, you know, cause we try to get as much information as we can because trust us, like we want to get the house closed too. Yeah, we don't get <laughs> like, a penny. So we don't, we don't get paid to like manage them. Like we have properties right now for, maybe, Four years for Robert? Four. Yeah, that place in Wharton. For four years. We've been managing it for four years. We haven't made a nickel on it. Um, so we want to get paid just, just as bad as the next person. And the bank hasn't made anything on it. And they're just spending and spending and spending. So the motivation is... Paying like, the taxes on yeah. it. You know, and not getting so, the rental income since the guy's not paying. We want to sell them. We don't... Like, people ask, like, oh, well, you just want to hold them because you get monthly money. It's not true. You get zero. The only thing we get is the same thing the selling agent gets. Yeah, and I gotta pay. I gotta pay the electric bill, and the gas bill, and the water bill, and the sewer bill. Vacant <laughs> property registrations, everything. Yeah. You know. What's up? Question about foreclosure listings. If somebody's looking for short sales, you can go on the MLS and you can do lender approval required, and you look for yes and you see it. But I've had people tell me they give me properties, I guess, off Realtor.com or whatever, but they're not listed in the MLS. Aren't there it's, websites people can pay money to for? Those are, are those are pre foreclosures. Pre -foreclosures. So yeah, everything is public record. So like you can go on to Somerset County right now yep. and see who's going up for sheriff sale, or you can go on and look for a Liz Pendon, which is a pre foreclosure. When you stop paying your mortgage, the bank will file a Liz Pendon and it puts a mark on the deed and says, you know, we have first position yep. should anything happen you know we're taking uh, what is the word They're, once they go Liz pendant that's when they hit realtor.com and yeah. slow and everything so because that information gets pulled yep. from the public websites yep and it's all it's all a lot of counties are public um hundred counties not because they're yeah hundred county you have to go there with their systems like warren county is somerset county is 
Uh, you could go on right now today and go to Liz Pendants for, uh, for the last year, and you could look at everybody who's missed payments, um, who's Liz Pendants, and you could also see if they, they got out of it, if they're current again, and all that stuff. So like, we'll look at the sheriff sales, you know, we'll, like uh, when there was sheriff sales, we'll look at them and say, okay, which properties are we gonna get? Because we know which, which clients we represent. So if everything's public, everybody could see everything, and you know, you know how much the, the judgments are for, like, you'll never believe, like these $100,000 houses, they owe the bank $750,000. Um, it's, it's incredible. But it's all public, you know, anybody could see it. Um, yeah, and that's where the people are going to Zillow yep. and Realtor.com, and they can search pre-foreclosures. And then there are agents that pay money to get notice of the upcoming sheriff sales? Uh, again, that's public record and it's, okay. it's online. Yeah. Like I'm friends with the ladies in the, in the hundred and sheriff's office. Um, you could just go online before. Com's good. They, they have a lot of up to date information. Yeah. Um, what, what's that? auction.com. The foreclosures before it gets to sheriff sale, the sheriff has to advertise for four weeks and make public notices in their, it's in the newspaper and it's online. By law, they have to do that. So anybody looking for, you know, a property can look on the sheriff's website and go, oh well, you know, Seven Mount Bethel Road is coming up for sheriff sale. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> plywood stacked in the back. <laughs> There's plywood where? Yeah. Plywood. Yeah, we can sell that. Yeah, we can sell. We can sell that and pay it off. <laughs> Can you turn that up? I can't. Uh, see. The volume. Let's see. Or just ask. It. Hi, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. You can, and it's it's kind of like I I've, I've been telling agents for God months now, or probably years. You know, with inventory being so low. You know, and your buyer is like, hey, I want to live in this neighborhood, in this, you know, in Bridgewater or something like that. Print out the pre-approval letter, go knock on the door and say, hey, you know, have you thought about moving? You know, I have a, I have a qualified buyer right here. I mean, you're not just randomly door knocking. You're saying, hey, I have a guy. And sometimes, you know, I've, I did it with a buyer uh, two years ago. And a guy's like, yeah, you know what? I, I think we do want to sell. We looked at the house, turns out my buyer didn't like it. But you know, it doesn't cost anything. And yeah. it shows your buyer that you're out there, you know, proactive. being proactive. Awesome. Yeah, and, and, and to answer that too, just because they're pre-foreclosure, that just means they're not paying the loan. So let's say they have a half million dollar house, they might only owe 50 grand, they're just not paying on it. So you can still go out and buy it, title will still be clear, stuff like that, but more times than, than, than none, Chances are it's going to be a little sticky. You know, they're going to have a, a ton of loans. They're going to have possibly liens. Um, so you just got to make sure it goes back to having the right attorney. Um, you know, you need an attorney that can navigate that stuff because it's it's not like your, your typical, you know, straight line transaction where it's like, okay, here's the offer, inspections, appraisal, you know, we're closing. It's going to be a lot more work, but uh, it's still possible, but just a little bit more difficult. And you can yeah. provide us with a list of attorneys perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. We work with, uh, well, one that Howard's working with right now, who's you're happy with. Yeah. He's um, really good. But some of them, we had this other attorney back in the day. Um, they got too busy and it was like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm case by case. And it's like, well, that's good for you, but not good for us. So we stopped working with her. Um, but there's other attorneys out there and he'll send them if you want them. Thank you. Yeah. And to go with the short sales and the foreclosures, well, pre-foreclosures, we always tell people the worst thing you can do is nothing. Like if you're behind, you need to be in communication with the bank and, you know, cause the bank is a machine. You cannot stop it. And they don't want to foreclose on you. They don't. They're not in the business of real estate. They're in the business of making money because a lot of times they'll like this house in Flemington, you know, they don't know when sheriff sales are going to open back up. So if you come to them and say, hey, you want to get this off the books now? They'd be like, yes, okay, let's work together. Yep. You know, they're not, they don't have to carry it anymore. They don't have to pay the taxes on it anymore. And a house will depreciate 
you know, 10% every six months just sitting there deteriorating. Yep. Yep. You get mold. You get anything coming in. You get stolen copper. I mean, you get everything. Yeah. It's bad. Pipes break, you know, floods. Yeah. You start getting fines from the town because you're not mowing a lawn. Yep. So it gets sticky. And they, they got to go hire a preservation team to take care of the property. But somebody's still living there halfway in, halfway out, they're not going to do it. So uh, you lose your equity quick. Yeah. And I think coming up, if there are short sales, the banks are going to be more willing to work with people, you know, because home prices are up. You know, if it goes to sheriff sale, they're not going to get as much as if you sold it today at retail. It it, 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 it depends, depends. On, on the client. She asked if you're responsible for the grass and everything. Most clients of ours have a property preservation company. Yep. Could be Safeguard, Service Link, uh, Guardian, any one of those. Um, and they're responsible for mowing the lawn. Yep. But as, you know, as the agent in charge, we have to make sure that they're doing their job because sometimes they don't do their job. Yep. And smaller clients, they'll just have us hire uh, local landscapers. Like we had a property that was 70 miles away from here. We didn't know anybody. Um, so we just hired some, one of the neighbors, he lived like behind the property and he cut it every two weeks and sent us the pictures and we sent him a check. So it all depends. Um, but more times than not, um, usually they have a preservation team. No, no. The, the bank does. So they, they have a basically a service contract with them and they, they take care of all that. But uh, Howard does all the paying and he pays, I mean, it, it, it's a lot. Uh, he pays gas bills, water bills, liens. I mean, you name it, he's paying it. Sewer um, bills. Sewer bills. I mean, I don't want to tell you what he spent the one year, but um, it, if I told you, you wouldn't believe us. Yeah. But you get that money back from the bank. Yeah, but, but you get it back. So it, yeah, but it, it, but it still comes out of the It could be, now. you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. There yeah. was a client of ours that owed me a little over $30,000. And they said, oh, you got to go down to Plainfield and pay this <laughs> $6,000 sewer bill. And I told them, no, no, not doing that. Yep. I said, you owe me. I said, you pay the sewer bill. You get a lot of miles on your credit card. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I have an Amex, I have a Hilton Honors Amex card, so we get free hotel rooms for my business. <laughs> Anything that I can put on the Amex, I do, and then, you know, because it, it, gets, it gets paid Yeah, he loves when he's got to pay the oil bills or the propane bills. Yeah, they're filling it up today. Great. 500 bucks right there. But, yeah, it's really, like, capital intensive. But as a selling agent, you don't care. Um, yeah, you know. just don't be scared of the foreclosures. I mean, and you know, if you have an offer on one and the agent is not being responsive, which, you know, it could be any agent anywhere, uh, you know, you could call me and, you know, ask, Hey, what do I do here? You know, how do I push this along? You know, it's also with the, <clears throat> with the attorneys. Mm -hmm. So, and they're saying that there's going to be a 0% chance of a wave, but it's, it's going to happen. And when the sheriff does open back up, hopefully in June, the end of June, beginning of July, um, stop it. <laughs> I told you to be positive. Um, I'm the positive one. Uh, <laughs> there's going to be a wave that comes. And I think... I personally think with the buyer demand that's out there, they will disappear so fast and it won't affect home values at all. You know, they'll get swallowed up. And I was, we just watched that, uh, the Rio Max seminar last night yeah. and they were talking about that. They're like, you know, without the foreclosures on the market, that's also hurting the inventory because usually there's a, a steady stream of foreclosures, you know, yeah. cause it's, it's an ongoing thing. Like, you know, People get divorced and they can't pay, you know, and then eventually they lose the house or medical bills or, you know, 
it happens all the time. You know, we say bad things happen to good people all the time, but you know, we're here to help with the short sales and you know, the foreclosures. But I think it'll be, I think 2022 and 2023. I mean, cause yeah. you gotta think like, I live in Hunterdon County and there's about five sheriff sales a week. So, you know, you're looking at 20, 20 a month mm -hmm. times 12 months, that's 240 homes just in Hunterdon County in a year, you know, but you move into like Somerset County, Middlesex, Union. I've been to the sheriff sales in Middlesex and Union. They've gotten so big, they're not even at the uh, sheriff's offices anymore. I think Union is in the auditorium across the street. Middlesex has moved down the road to the Elks Club. I was at Union God, probably three years ago and I counted 65 people standing in the room. They were just, they were lined around the room. So they are very popular and when they come back, there's gonna be people trying to spend money yeah, buying houses. They have money to spend. Yeah. yeah. There hasn't been any investment properties right. or foreclosures in over a year. So all those guys that were flipping houses. They got all their money back and no inventory. Yeah. So be interesting. So foreclosures, you know, they do you know, I hate to say it that way, but foreclosures do help the economy. You know, with the tradesmen and, you know, realtors and flippers and Any other questions? Anything else? Anyone on that computer? Wait. Our earnest money deposits. So your the, the money you give to your attorney uh, when you go under contract on the property. Or, yeah, or the, the good faith deposit. People call yeah, the, that. the initial um, deposit. Yeah. It's, uh, and there, there's only one deposit, right? Yeah. Yes. The EMD also known as the initial deposit. And like I said before, it has to be 1% of the purchase price or more. So if you're buying a $200,000 house, it's two grand. They wanna make sure that you got some skin in the game. Uh, it actually gets credited back to them at closing because two years ago uh, I had a veteran. It, well, yeah, he was a veteran. He used his VA loan yep. and you know, you put the thousand dollar deposit up front. Um, that home was actually, it was a it was 300. Wasn't it? I was pretty, I'm pretty sure it was a foreclosure, but it was owned by a private investor. It wasn't owned by a bank. Um, and then it just gets credited back at closing yep. on the HUD but they, they definitely want money. So even though they're not putting any money down, it'll just get applied to their closing costs or, or whatever, or they, or they will get it back, but they, they need money. Yeah. And as far as, you know, banks, it's not really, foreclosures have really changed over the years. Um, like Bank of America or Wells Fargo, they'll, you know, send a property a share of sale but it'll be packaged into uh, what they call an NPL, which is a non-performing loans. And they'll sell a package to a hedge fund like Wilmington Savings Trust or US Bank or something like that. That hedge fund will then take those 30 properties and look at them and go, okay, you know, let's sell this one, sell this one, you know, repair this one. They are doing repairs now. Um, like the farm we had, they put, oh God, we put a little over $200,000 into that house before we sold it. Um, doing a townhouse right now in Branchburg, Branchburg it's doing an $80,000 renovation. So they'll, they'll analyze it and say, well, the agent will do the, the BPO and say, look, you could sell it for 250 now, or you could put 80 into it and sell it for 400. So they're really, that's another thing that's hurting flippers. They'll cut the middleman out and say, well, you know, we can make that profit. Why would we sell it and let that guy make that profit? Yep. So they're becoming, you know, more aware and making, it's not like years ago, they were just like, you know, yeah, cut and run, just dump this property, whatever we can get for it. They, they analyze properties a lot and you can't go in and try to low ball. You know, they know what the property's worth. 
they've had yeah. you know, five, six people out there to tell them this property is worth this much. Yeah, you gotta realize that the lien holders, so like the PNC Bank or Wells Fargo, they already lost at sheriff sales. So they recovered their money. Now the people, like at least that we represent, is they bought this as an investment. I mean, they could spend upwards of a billion dollars on one portfolio with X amount of houses and all over the, the country. And then if they paid a billion, you know, they have their preferred turn. They might want to make 10% on the portfolio or 20%. So that's why they're all about the numbers. And uh, that's why even though it is a foreclosure, you don't really see them being blown out like Howard said. Like if we have something listed for 300, they're not going to accept two and a quarter. Um, they, they're just too smart nowadays. So.